I remember once I was called by the nurses on a busy night shift when I was working as an intern in Civil Hospital Karachi. It was to attend to an elderly patient who was complaining of a lot of abdominal pain. He was unable to say much because he had a prior CVA, but pointing to his lower belly. The nurses were concerned despite regular painkillers, his pain keeps on coming back. I went and examined the patient and found acute urinary retention. I'd never put in a urinary catheter before, but knew the principles. And with a bit of confidence and a lot of luck, I was able to successfully catheterize that patient that immediately put relief on patient's face. And I still remember that look. Some of the skill sets are unique to your own specialty, but basic clinical procedure skills are essential for all doctors. And today I'm going to highlight 10 clinical procedure skills that every doctor must know, regardless of their seniority and the specialty that they practice in. And to make it more interesting, I will relate with a real life story why these procedures are so important. And finally, I'll wrap it off with my top five tips that must be followed before and after every procedure. Number one, basic airway management. In case of any emergency in a ward or an ED, the basic airway assessment and management with head tilt and chin lift and putting in a nasopharyngeal airway or an oropharyngeal airway, otherwise known as airway adjuncts, can be life-saving skill. Whilst working as a consultant, we once had a seven-month-old baby boy in extreme respiratory distress due to bronchiolitis. And despite whatever we did, he just did not improve and unfortunately looked like that he is going to be intubated. But nobody could intubate him in emergency at that time. However, we were able to bag valve mask him with near normal oxygen levels Still, the help arrived in a form of ENT who were able to fiber optically intubate the child very safely. Today, when I ask junior doctors, by the way of various clinical scenario about handling an airway emergency, it is so surprising to see that their focus is on intubation when clearly it should be on how to properly hold a mask, on creating an adequate seal with an airway adjuncts and bagging properly to maintain that breathing and oxygen levels to save patient's life. And if you know, in advanced airway courses, basic airway management with or without LMA is number one recommended pathway as a failsafe mechanism in all of these critical airway courses and algorithms. Number two, intravenous cannulation and blood sampling. Recently, I was working with a doctor, a junior doctor, who said to me that the reason he has actually de-skilled in cannulation because in Pakistan, all the cannulation was done by nurses, pediatric, adult, everyone. Now, cannulation is one of those basic skills which is essential that every doctor must know in both pediatric and adult patients. Now, IV access can be very challenging, especially in emergency situation when the patients are dry and dehydrated and also in children who can be very anxious and the veins can often be very hard to find in children. I have realized there are 10 places on human body that can be easily cannulated on each of these sites just by palpation method alone. Plus, cannulation is one of those key skill or key principles on which other skills are built on like arterial line insertion and blood gas sampling. Number three, intraosseous access. I recently had a patient in a small peripheral hospital where I was working as a consultant who needed an immediate access, but he was a known complicated IV cannulation patient. This time, it was critical because he was in respiratory sepsis with shock. I had to put an intraosseous access in. The thing that I realized that more you get to learn the IO, the better and easier it gets. And your patient have timely fluids and timely intervention. You can always revisit the situation and put the IVC or intravenous cannulation once the patient is a bit more hydrated and more stabilized and even use an ultrasound when the time is available. Now, NG tube insertion is not just a tube insertion in any other cavity. It's a proper procedure with its own serious risks and complication. I remember one working in a neurosurgery ward as an intern, a nurse inserted an NG tube overnight in a patient for feeding purpose but did not confirm the placement of the tube. The feeding was then started and the patient aspirated. Unfortunately, the patient had poor gag and cough reflex due to critical head injury and hence the incorrect positioning of the NG tube was not properly identified. Now, NG tube insertion requires correct sizing, measurements and clinical as well as radiologic confirmation. Again, a very important skill. Number five, urinary catheterization, both male and females. Urinary catheterization can be both diagnostic 
and therapeutic diagnostic when you're trying to find out about you know urinary sepsis in a patient who is very delirious or therapeutic when the patient is in urinary retention. A few weeks ago, there was a patient from a nursing home who was brought in due to acutely highly agitated condition and was requiring constant sedation to facilitate a CT brain. When I reviewed the patient, it was clear that he was in acute urinary retention. I helped sedate the patient and the IDC was put in by another doctor. And when the patient woke up from the sedation and having had the IDC established in, he was much more settled. Now again, the correct sizing, confirmation of the IDC placement and securing the catheter with a proper education of the patient or the carer, care for the catheter are still the part of the procedure. It should be practiced both in males and females. Number six, vaginal speculum examination. On my first shift working as an emergency consultant, I saw a young female patient in resuscitation area. She had what we called heavy vaginal bleeding from a miscarriage and she was in cervical shock. ONG were busy in theater at that time. But we were able to remove the retained products of conception from cervix and the patient immediately recovered from the shock. Learning speculum exam can be a lifesaver in such patient and every junior doctor must learn this skill, not only to just assess as a part of their medical diagnostic, but also sample and sending them for various investigation. Number seven, lumbar puncture. On my first job here in Australia as an emergency resident, I had to do an LP on a patient of mine. The only problem was that I'd never done an LP before. The senior doctor who was working with me said to me, prepare a trolley and do the procedure. And he's just going to stand over my shoulder and guide me. For this instruction, set up my trolley, and he just maintained a distance and kept a close eye on me. And soon enough, I had my first successful LP. From that day, I realized LP is all about, you know, feeling the landmarks and putting in the needle and feeling like skin, fascia, ligamentum phallum, and dura being pierced. So it's a very manual skill, which can only be tested in real life in real patients. Number eight, PLS. As a junior doctor on night shifts, no matter what specialty you are working in, you will encounter a sudden patient deterioration, and you might be the first responder at that scene, and you might be expected to provide BLS. The first time I did my compressions on a real patient, it felt very strange. I was full of doubt whether this patient is going to make it or not. However, compression is just another way of buying time till help arrives and they're able to work out the underlying condition and they're able to treat that condition to save patients' lives. A few years ago, I was attending a resuscitation conference in which people or patients rather were, uh, were brought in who were saved by prompt CPR by first responders, by bystanders. And I was surprised to see so many children and young patients saved by some of the bystanders over there. So learn this skill and keep it polished so you can use this skill anytime. Number nine, advanced life support. Basic rhythm recognition and defibrillation and pacing. Now basic rhythm recognition like bradycardia or VT or VF may seem very simple on ALS course algorithms, but when you have to do them as a team, this is what saves a real life. I may have now lost count the number of times I may have to run the ALS code in emergency department, but as a team leader, it is my responsibility that every member is doing their task from rhythm recognition to delivering a shock compressions. And all of these tasks are done effectively as a part of the team. Number 10. Suturing, again a very basic skill. Recently we did a course in Wollongong Hospital where I was surprised to see how some participants have a very neat and tidy suturing techniques versus some participants whose sutures needed a lot of work and practice. But every suture placement on human skin must look very neat and tidy without any tension. This is not only good for the wound healing but also good for your own skill development. Finally, I'd like to give you my five top tips for every clinical procedure. Number one, see one, do one, teach one. Now you can see one on YouTube, do one on a patient and teach one to any junior medical or nursing staff. Number two, prepare your trolley and align all your equipment as you require them when you're doing a procedure. It saves a lot of effort and ensures that even as a single person, you can do the procedure. Number three, consent the patient and make sure they're aware of all the steps of the procedure. It removes a lot of anxiety for both the patients and also the doctor because they know what steps are to be followed. Number four, look out for the complications, especially the earlier ones like arterial cannulation when you know the blood is spurting out from the cannula when you're putting in a intravenous cannulation. And of course, the example that I gave you, NG tube insertion, not going into the lungs. So making sure you check the pH of the stomach contents and you confirm the tip position by doing an X-ray. Number five, documentation of the procedure. 
for record keeping and good medical practice. I hope you like this video and hopefully you get to practice and perfect all of these clinical procedure. Take a good care of yourself and your patients. Goodbye.